Madam Prime Minister, it's an honor to uh, be the one asking you all of the questions. I have been uh, an economist for 20 years for the cell side, and I think the most important lesson I've learned is that really the development of a country is so much about the vision of the leader and how well those are communicated. So I would like to take this opportunity to really go into the details of the very good overview that you gave us before and to bring it down also to a short, medium and long-term map so that uh, all types of investors can really kind of understand Moldova and play it at best. So you have just recently completed your first term, uh, first year as prime minister and you have been a civil servant for a long time. Uh, some of the achievements of Moldova you have already mentioned. Uh, the increase in per capita income is astonishing. Uh, the low financial stability risks that you've managed are incredible, especially given the, the energy issues that you've faced last year. So let's start by asking you what is your expectation for the next 12 to 15 months for your country? Is this on? Yes. Hi again. Um, it is very difficult to talk about the next 12-15 months. We all know that we are facing uh, extraordinary uncertainty in this part of the world and uh, uh, we are really affected by the energy crisis, the energy prices, the fallout of the unjust war in Ukraine, the disruption of the logistic chain, uh, logistics uh, chains, um, and uh, of course, rising inflation and cost of living. So um, in this period, uh, what we are doing is um, basically combining managing the crisis, the multiple and overlapping crisis, with addressing the long-standing developmental needs of Moldova. So on one hand, um, we are dealing with uh, the energy crisis, um, you know, are preparing different scenarios for the winter, uh, if we have a lower level of supply or if we have an interruption of supply. Um, we are thinking about actions of the government to compensate for the increase in the living costs. Uh, we are thinking uh, of instruments for the private sector to maintain jobs, uh, to keep afloat, uh, but at the same time, we are not forgetting about justice reform, about uh, combating corruption, about uh, you know better regulations uh, for small and medium en enterprises, about uh, you know long-term financing instruments, about events like this. Um, so. Uh, in a sense, uh, you know, and, and there was a talk about Purkari, and I want to give you this, uh, um, this uh, uh, perspective. You know, when we first faced the wine embargoes, uh, uh, when we couldn't sell the Moldovan wine to the Russian Federation, we saw a decrease in growth, we saw an impact on the economy, an impact on jobs, but at the same time, this... Uh, really made the industry become creative, uh, become resilient, concentrate on quality, concentrate on markets. And what we have now is, um, you know, wines that uh, win mo the most prizes in international uh, competitions. You know, this year we had uh, the gold medal for best red wine in the world. And we also have, you know, beautiful places for internal tourism and for international tourism. So when I talk to businessmen in, uh, in the country and to investors, what I say is, you know, yes, there is uncertainty. Yes, we will pay the consequences uh, of what we're seeing now. But at the same time, you know, we are, we are working to lay the foundation for resilience and growth in the future. I want to look back five years from now and say it was very difficult at the time, but we did put the country on the stable path towards the European Union um, and you know, the European quality of life and the values that we aspire to. So embrace the difficulty to be stronger, seems to be the ethos, that's perfect. 
so walk us through a little bit the um, EU membership journey. How many people do you have working on it? Uh, how long do you think realistically it will take? I think everybody knows it's not quick, but at least what is your expectations and maybe what are kind of the key milestones of meetings that we can look forward to? Um, again, you know, uh, I will uh, uh, use the fact that I am a politician and start with a narrative and a story. <laughs> Uh, so 20 years ago, I remember in my first job uh, when there was discussion about uh, Moldova's accession uh, to the European Union as part of the Central European states and the Balkan states. And, you know, at that time we missed the window of opportunity. And I remember discussions that we don't know when history will turn and another moment of opportunity uh, will arise. And what I can say is that, you know, nobody thought... You know, think about it, just four or five months ago, nobody thought that Moldova could jump you know, several steps, leapfrog, and become a, mem a candidate country. Um, you know, a window of opportunity opened, uh, the history presented um, you know, this uh, you know, terrible tragedy which actually led to us becoming um, candidate country to the European Union. So, first of all, I'm very glad that we didn't miss uh, this uh, uh, moment in history. And, of course, what we are doing is uh, trying to hurry while we are dealing with all these crises. So, our main problem is limited state capability. So, uh, we have... Uh, designed a mechanism uh, where uh, we will create the working groups for 35 chapters of negotiations and we will start work doing our homework. It will take a long time, we understand this, but we will do everything possible to hasten it. So uh, we've created the position of um, um, State Secretary for European Affairs uh, in, in ministries. Uh, we have adopted legislation to reform the policy units and make them responsible not only for policy but European integration. We are uh, giving a top-up to civil servants who will be involved in uh, the work on uh, the uh, European agenda and the uh, negotiations um, uh, on accession. And uh, most importantly, we are working on quickly addressing those conditionalities that the Commission has pointed out as um, improvements to be made before negotiate, actual accession negotiations start. And I'm talking here, first of all, about justice reform. We have, um, we just recently uh, had a discussion with my colleagues in Parliament and we have a plan to submit 23 different legislative initiatives in the justice sector in the next three months. So we're talking here uh, about, uh, um, uh, you know, we are doing the external evaluation of judges and prosecutors in the Superior Council of Magistrates and the Superior Council of Prosecutors. We are looking at improving the distribution of competences between the different institutions. We are looking at creating stronger anti-corruption uh, mechanisms. As you may know, uh, we had uh, a very impressive appointment of an anti-corruption prosecutor uh, who is a Moldovan member of the diaspora. So she is a U.S. federal prosecutor and decided to come back and contribute to the development of the country. So she comes with a lot of credibility and a very good reputation and uh, uh, a vision on how, uh, where the system should go. So, so we will be working hard um, on this legislation. We will be continuing our work on combating corruption, on deregulation, you know, removing opportunities for corruption um, and rents. We will be uh, designing uh, a new salary system. We will be looking at administrative reform. So we are, in, in, a, in a sense, we are in a race with time. So we want to make sure that in this historic um, uh, window of opportunity, we actually are able to open negotiations as well. You think that 
because as you said, the scale of the, of the task is enormous, right? But would it be reasonable to say that to some extent you already benefit from financial support of the EU and the more steps you show, the more that financing can come through so that people don't get lost in the race. You know, they can see that it's an incremental step forward. Uh, indeed, we do get uh, assistance uh, from the European Union as an Eastern Partnership country. Uh, of course, uh, when we are faced with such uh, dramatic crises uh, and uh, uh, such an increase uh, in uh, inflation and especially in prices for energy resources, uh, we need more support. Uh, so uh, we, de we definitely need more financing for 2023. Um, at the same time, uh, the support that we have received uh, has helped us uh, in the crisis of last year. We have provided uh, compensations uh, to the most vulnerable. We are now working on a targeted energy vulnerability mechanism that will allow us uh, to help those most in need. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, this support uh, has allowed us to at least partly compensate for the loss uh, in real wages or in purchasing power. Uh, so uh, we will continue to count on our friends. We are very grateful to the Romanian government, uh, which is one of the um, um, initiators uh, of the Moldova support uh, uh, platform alongside with France and Germany. And uh, uh, we will definitely continue discussing these issues uh, during the next meeting, which will take place in November in Paris. Thank you, and, and maybe I'll, I'll ask a, a last question, but it's a big topic. Uh, of course, on inflation, this is a big theme. Uh, your inflation rate is, is high, absolutely, but you've also been hit uh, by a disproportionately large uh, shock. And it's also, we live in an age where inflation is a big problem for, for everyone. So um, give us, your overall strategy on how to deal with, with inflation. I mean, some of it, it certainly has to do with uh, some, you know, mitigating the effects uh, fiscally. But tell us about your, uh, your expectation on, on the central bank, your views on the exchange rate, productivity. You know, give us maybe what you think is, uh, is the key in all of this fight. Indeed, uh, inflation is uh, very high. Last month, uh, inflation exceeded 34% already. Uh, the rate uh, of uh, acceleration has uh, decreased, so it's not growing as fast as it was in the previous months. Uh, at the same time, um, uh, a big part of this uh, inflation uh, depends on what will happen to energy prices. Um, and uh, uh, this is a very big concern. Uh, at the same time, uh, of course, we um, are seeing increase in food, food prices and because this is a much larger uh, proportion of a household's consumption than in developed countries, this actually shows up in a disproportionately high inflation. But uh, um, the National Bank is actually the institution that is responsible for inflation targeting. It's, it's subordinated to the parliament, it's an independent institution, and uh, it has taken action to increase uh, the base rate and, uh, and uh, moderate uh, inflation um, uh, th through uh, a, a um, you know, aggressive sort of uh, increase in, in the base rate. Uh, this, of course, puts more pressure on the government, uh, so we have to have an expansionary fiscal policy and think about those groups and those people that need to be supported um, uh, under these circumstances, particularly given the uh, limitations of the financial markets that we have already talked about. Um, so what, what we are doing is, uh, on one hand, sort of uh, growing salaries and uh, moderately, <laughs> and uh, also providing uh, sort of uh, one-time support to help people through the winter. We are working on these targeted 
compensation mechanisms. So we have a targeted social assistance program, we, had a, we have a winter program, and now we are adding this energy vulnerability program that will look both at income and consumption and categorize households based on this. Um, we are also, uh, as many countries actually, uh, intervening more than we would like to, given that we are a center-right party. So, for example, we have expanded the um, number of products that are considered socially important and have a limited um, uh, commercial add-on. Uh, or limited, yeah, all, all types of sort of uh, additional payments uh, are limited. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are uh, discussing with uh, various stakeholders and uh, negotiating basically on, you know, what, what we can do uh, under these uh, circumstances. So, uh, for example, we have taken um, uh, quite significant efforts to discuss even with the authorities of the Transnistrian region, uh, first of all, to keep peace and stability, but also to keep the price of electricity um, low. Uh, so uh, even though this means that we are negotiating every month and we don't have sustainability, but for the last six months or so, we have managed to keep electricity prices stable and this has helped uh, to not increase inflation as much. So we will continue basically acting um, and, and inter intervening both through our emergency mechanism and through our regular policies uh, to uh, make sure that you know, we support the most vulnerable, we support uh, those uh, businesses that um, uh, are under strain and need, uh, for example, um, you know, capital to um, maintain jobs. We have introduced uh, furlough schemes, which we did not have before, even during the uh, COVID times. So, uh, we will use all these instruments uh, available to us uh, to make sure that on the one hand we don't allow uh, extraordinary sort of, uh, we don't allow inflation to sort of reach a spiral, but at the same time, uh, you know, keep as much as possible uh, the vulnerable uh, supported by the state. Thank you. So it seems that you are really trying to manage all of these conflicting uh, forces to give time for the country to, to manage this, this evil path, but I think uh, we can all see that the outlook is, is very bright. You have, an, uh, you have a very compelling convergence path uh, ahead of you and, and a compelling desire to integrate well in the international financial market. So we wish you well, and we're looking forward to see the next episodes. <laughs> Thank you very much. And let's think medium and long term, and that will provide an optimistic view.